Howdy folks, it's time for another Edge magazine, this time Edge issue 43, and uh, this would be March 1997, discussing the future of interactive entertainment, and we have on the cover, we have Hiroshi Yamauchi, don't know how to pronounce that name, uh, yet another amazingly hideous cover uh, made by Edge in the mid-90s. I um, I guess the process went like this. Well, we, they didn't have any really big, good articles to put on the cover. So they were like, okay, well, we can't put the M2 on the cover because we're not even sure that's going to be released. And Ninja doesn't look that good, even though we had a pretty good exclusive. So we'll put the boss of Nintendo on the cover, but how do we make him look interesting? Well, this is how they ended up doing that. Let's see what they have to say on him. Uh, the opening column is about how the Nintendo 64 is kind of, yes, no, having a good launch. In retrospect, it had a subpar um, success compared to Nintendo's two previous consoles, but... Uh, I think it did okay. Had some of the greatest games of all time. And it certainly has aged better than the PlayStation. So there's also an article about video game myths, which is fun. So the uh, latest news is that Bandai merges with Sega and Edge uh, proclaims that it's mostly because both companies aren't doing that well. Um, in the mid, in the early 90s, they were at the top of the world with Power Rangers, which is Bandai, and the Mega Drive slash Genesis. But uh, by 1997, they were hurting. Nintendo 64 finally being released in Europe. <clears throat> Here we have uh, some arcade show. We see a GTI Club, one of the last great arcade games. Scud Race is shown, which I talked to you about last time, being kind of like Daytona, but using the uh, the A3 engine, the Virtual Fighter 3 graphics engine. Uh, Scavenger, the British coders who were mostly known for making amazing graphics on the Saturn, aren't doing that well. And Philips is finally stopping with video game hardware. We're going to focus a little bit on software, I believe. Um, yeah, Final Fantasy VII is released in Japan, and it's a humongous success. This is what, this will be the killing blow to the Saturn. Um, I would argue that up until now, the Saturn and the PlayStation were doing just as well. Uh, they were in Japan, um, and if you look at the library games, they would be quite comparable. I mean, uh, the, the Saturn had Guardian Heroes, for example, and the PlayStation had um, yeah, what did they have? I guess Die Hard Trilogy? Anyhow, there weren't that many really good games. Oh yeah, Resident Evil was probably the best game for the PlayStation 1 up until then. And, um, yeah, I, I, I personally didn't feel like neither of the consoles were worth getting, but with Final Fantasy VII, it was finally a really big must-have game. Um, Tamagotchis are finally released. Apparently... In early 1997, Japan, uh, they're extremely popular. They would go on to take over the world for a brief stint. There's some talk about cosplaying and Edge making jokes to them, saying that only in Japan people would do this, but 20 years later, everybody's doing it. And there's still no news on the M2. So what's up with that? So here's an article about games for girls, even though they mostly look at this Barbie game being sold for the computer, which is a pretty lame dressing game. Um, and Edge argues that this is probably only being sold because of the name Barbie on it. It's, uh, well, as far as I can tell, if I go on the internet and I check out free games to play online, I see a lot of games like these. Um, I don't know why, but it seems that for whatever reason, women seem to spend less money on games than men do. Maybe because they're not earning as much in the marketplace. Okay, so here's a two-page article on 
patching games, which at the time was a new thing to do. You would go on the internet and apply patches to the games you already had. So I just discussed this a little bit. It's mostly Quake uh, that's of interest because of all the modifications. Here we have uh, Yamauchi, a very stubborn guy. And apparently he is a 7th Dan in the board game Go, which is extremely high. So he's at least good at thinking ahead and figuring out his opponent. So that's a bit of his history, how he uh, correctly understood that the market in 1983 was oversaturated. But 1995-96, which are current times for this magazine, it's a question if that strategy still holds true. Nintendo 64, uh, I believe, could have done better if Nintendo were more open for different companies to uh, make games for it. Then again, the PlayStation used CDs, which were easy to copy, which were cheaper to make, and that really helped distribute the PlayStation brand, something that Nintendo 64 could never do with cartridges. And uh, so Nintendo 64 was the quality console at the time. Yamauchi uh, had faith in that. Uh, there's a lot of um, this discussion about how stubborn he is and how he... Uh, um, yeah, it gives a hard time uh, for computer uh, computer game developers. Also, the uh, the backlog about the uh, show about a couple months ago, where uh, the 1064 was supposed to be showing a lot of games, then he decided the match to remove, I believe, ten or so demos of third party games, just so that everybody could focus on Super Mario 64, which was a much better game than the demos shown by third party developers. Um, yeah, again, choosing quality over quantity. And uh, Nintendo 64 didn't have that many excellent games, but I think all, altogether just as many as the PlayStation 1. It had much less games, though. Okay, so pre scream Alpha is anything interesting? I uh, uh, Here's V Rally, apparently first called VR Rally. That's kind of a funny name. Uh, a, a pretty good rally game at the time. Dark Earth? I don't remember that game. So uh, here's some Jurassic Park game, the the Neverhood. Anything else I recognize? I actually don't. Is this Homeworld or something? Called Hard War? Anyhow. Um, here we have a game that's like Gauntlet. It's called uh, Mage Slayer. Don't recall that one either. Jeez, I feel like a, a noob. I should know these games, right? But I don't. Here's Typing the Dead or the other one, uh, House of Dead, of course, that was first released. That would become a hit. And Hang Pilot by Konami. Doesn't ring a bell either. So here's Ninja, uh, made by Core, who also made Tomb Raider. And from what I understand, it was a success in Europe, this game. Um, but... Beyond that, it wasn't. Not that much information on the game. I find it surprising because there was a lot of marketing. It's a very rather simple uh, beat-em-up game with platforming sections. Apparently, it's a bit harder than most games. And, uh, yeah, they mostly talk about the graphics. It's a rather simple uh, action game. Very typical for the time. It seems to be that... Uh, Edge, even uh, though they seem to be the kind of magazine that would prefer gra uh, gameplay over graphics, uh, all they talk about in the previews are the new types of graphics. Here's Interloop, who would uh, eventually help IGI, that, that combat game of sorts. Um, I don't know. This uh, They were working on an engine, and this is a Norwegian company, by the way. They were working on an engine for multiple purposes, basically how to get... Uh, 3D areas and incorporate them all kinds of ways. We see driving, we see flying, uh, we see snowboarding. So that's what they're selling. And it was used, it was used for a couple of games, but none, none of them were standout. Uh, Terracide, getting two pages, even though um, it's mostly remembered for being a um, subpar sequel to Descent. So, um, not that interesting. But it was being made in the UK, so that's why Edge had to look at it. Just like the Kickoff series is, I think, one of the last series. Uh, as a 16-bit game, Kickoff was above average. But 
now it had to compete in 3D with uh, International Superstar Soccer and FIFA and actual soccer, so they didn't do that well. This is the most interesting part of the magazine, I think. Uh, talking to a UK developer for Power Crystal, which would be a um, action RPG for the M2. And reading it, it sounds a lot like The Elder Scrolls Part 2, which was had already been released uh, in 1996. But there's no mention of it here. But they talk about how your character would get good at things for doing certain things. So, you, know, f- you know, fighting would help you fighting, and crafting would make you a better crafter, trading would make you a better trader. And, uh, well, the graphics look kind of bad, if you ask me. Of course, still, I guess, technically better than Elder Scrolls 2. Can we sharpen up a bit, even though sharpening the image wouldn't help much? Uh, there's talk about which things they use polygons for, which things they use sprites for. It's uh, um, it's it's very much a pipe dream. It's way too big to actually make. Uh, it could have worked, I guess, on the M2 technology if it were close to the power of the set, uh, the Dreamcast. I mean, we had we had Shenmue on the Saturn, and I believe a game like Fable would also work on this. Uh, sorry, on the Dreamcast, um, with maybe smaller areas or less d- graphical details. Uh, Elder Scrolls Three would that work on the Dreamcast? Mm, probably not. So here's uh, the Symphony of the Night, finally, with uh, some uh, non-Western images. This would be a classic, uh, one of the best games for the PlayStation 1, even though sticking to 2D uh, gameplay. Uh, I myself prefer Order of Ecclesia and Area of Sorrow to this game, but still one of the best Castlevania games of all time. Uh, I never liked the second half. Uh, the bosses were okay, but um, yeah, I just felt kind of tacked on. Yeah, it really was tacked on the second half with, uh, of course, subpar um, level design. So we have Runabout. Uh, it had another name in the United States I can't remember. It's a um, racing game with a lot of uh, destruction while you're at it. So you, you race and you destroy things, kind of like the Yakuza missions, I guess. So uh, Edge looking, giving it two pages, um, even though it, because it's from Climax, for some reason, Edge always gave a lot of attention to Climax games. Here's an interesting part. Um, the Dark Project, indeed, Thief, before it was known as Thief. They mentioned that your play is a thief and that sneaking around is more important than combat, but there's no talk of uh, Gerard, I think his name was, or Gareth. And the enemies, uh, they never came about in the final thief game they would all be humans um you know the templars and all that um even the levels i don't recall them so i what i see are basically it's basically the engine that's all we see here um the enemies aren't incorporated yet nor is the game but they talk about what they'll do you know having arrows and um and only a sword so that's cool looking glass becoming the powerhouse they would become. The Tenth Planet was never released. It's for the computer, made by Bethesda, but never released, unfortunately. So, uh, I guess they were busy with their uh, Elder Scrolls games. I don't know. It looks like Elder Scrolls in outer space, kind of like Elite. Here's Myth, the Fallen Lords, which would be a cult classic. It's a RTS, um, more focused on combat and less on building. And... Um, and they're showing off the 3D engine. That's what they mostly talk about here, actually, that it's a full 3D RTS. Going back to 2D, we have Go Go Troublemakers, uh, the game by Treasure for Nintendo 64, a fast paced um, action platformer uh, where you could use your enemies to your advantage. That was pretty cool. Uh, highly underrated, one of the better Nintendo 64 games. Um, shame it didn't get that much attention. Yeah, called Mischief Maker, Makers, that was the name. Well, here's an ad for Nintendo 64, believe the hype. They don't have to tell you what's going to happen with the 1st of March. Well. Okay, um, video game myths. Which ones? Oh, I'd, I'd love to talk about all of these, but uh, the Bushnell Steel Pong, no. He helped with the technology and the idea, but of course somebody else really designed it. The M2 Merely Vapor. Well, uh, there's a full page on how uh, Tetris made its way to the West. 
ET, is it really being buried? Uh, we now have proof, I guess, even though I didn't find the proof very convincing. Um, space Wars, not th they're getting things confused. Oh yeah, there, there's some talk about that uh, Tennis for Two game, which was made before Space Wars. And this is the arcade version. That's kind of confusing because most people think about the uh, MIT lab version. Uh, Crime of the Century, um, I don't know, to me this is common knowledge that there are cartridges with hundreds of Nintendo and Super Nintendo games. Um, Mario's name being based on a landlord. You all know that story. Uh, the PlayStation being made with Nintendo. Atari should have released Pac-Man in the U.S., but decided not because they, didn't, they thought it was too simple. Yeah. Um, people dying of games. This is interesting how MicroPost started because there was a bet after Sid Meier did better at Red Baron, the arcade game, than this fellow. And uh, the army using um, Battlezone, um, game heroines and porn in games, I guess. And uh, the Game Boy using Sony chips for sound. Yes, they did. So what? Not a big deal. Oh, even more, uh, the, how Breakout was made at Atari, how Steve Wozniak did everything. And uh, something about Marvel Madness 2. Yeah, let's continue. Just want to talk about the times. Oh yeah, so new media. I don't like this section, um, but let's get through it. So there's a 3D movie maker where you can make animations. Uh, a CD-ROM with all this information on James Bond. This could be fun, a communicator of sorts. Uh, this was pretty cool, a 3D camera. <laughs> so you can make pictures and then make 3D versions of them, kind of like a Polaroid. Programmable game controller, not interesting. Here we have an internet telephone. Yeah, let's use that. That feels really 90s. More music by bands, I don't know. And three books on hacking. So um, they're mostly positive about this one, the uh, Approaching Zero, it's called, about the 80s, how they used to hack back then. Okay, reviews. MDK. A lot of people call it a murder death kill, but I've been told that it actually stands for uh, the three main characters. The third one being Kurt, who you actually play. I can never remember the first two. And it had uh, 3D graphics at the time, still quite impressive for a platforming game. You could zoom in on enemies, which was really cool. Uh, I was blown away by it at the time, though nowadays it seems kind of kind of normal. And you could fly a bit, you know, use this weird-looking parachute. I never got far in the game. Uh, it didn't seem that really interesting to me, but Edge loves it, and it gives it a 9. And uh, it was a, the first 3D game made by Shiny Entertainment, and it would cement their status in the industry as a really good video game maker. And then a couple years later, they would make Enter the Matrix, and they would lose all credit. Ecstatica 2. Again, a uh, survival horror game with more fighting going on, using uh, Epsiloids, I think they were called, so everything looks round. We saw it early in a preview. Uh, Edge gives it a 7, saying it's pretty good, but awkward controls. Not very popular outside of Europe, though. And Dark Savior getting two pages. Uh, kind of like, uh, what's it called? Lance Stalker, which was an excellent game on the Genesis. Not as good as Zelda 3, but kind of that. And uh, Dark Savior for the Saturn wasn't uh, really well it received because it seemed to be somewhat cumbersome. Gets a 7 out of 10. Uh, it used pretty nice 2D graphics, but uh, it wasn't any better than most action RPGs at the time. And that would end the series. There's also a Super Nintendo version that wasn't that good. Uh, Die Hard Arcade. So, not to be confused with Die Hard Trilogy, this is for the Saturn, maybe for the PlayStation, I don't remember. And uh, it's a fighting game, but uh, occasionally there are like these intermissions where you have to. Um, Shoot things, I think, and if you do, don't do that right, then you have to uh, do some more fighting. And uh, Edge gives it a six, but says that Guardian Heroes are is much better, and I would agree with them. A Race Storm, one of the better shoot 'em ups on the PlayStation One, but not as good as Einhander. And they give it a seven out of ten, made by uh, Tato, you know, Space Invaders. Monster Trucks. By Cynosis, you know, the people who made uh, Destruction Derby and Wipeout. Well, Monster Trucks only gets a 6 out of 10. I guess Edge kind of likes it, but nobody ever talked about it at the time. 
Micro Machines version 3, now all 3D on the PlayStation. Edge likes it, gives it an 8, but to me it sounds like more of the same. And I think this is one of the last Micro Machines games, because later you have Micromaniacs. Uh, I never really liked these games that much, to be honest. I would be rather be playing Mario Kart or something. So, I don't even know if there was a multi tap for four players for the PlayStation 1 at the time, but probably. Scorcher, made by, yeah, uh, Scavenger, the guy's good at Saturn graphics, and that show, Scorcher, looks fantastic on the Saturn, even though it's pretty dark. It's a racing game where you jump and tumble a lot with this funny looking ball. Um, Edge likes it, gives it a 7, but it's not as good as Wipeout or. Um, Actually, they compare it to Stunt Car Racer, which is much older I and mean, not quite the frame rate, but whatever. Uh, Hang Time, my favorite version of the NBA Jam uh, series, even to me, even better than the most recent ones because it keeps it simple to the point. I like the creative player mode. Edge doesn't like it that much. They give it a 5, which I find odd because last month or the month before that, they gave a 7 out of 10 to what's called NBA Jam Extreme for the PlayStation 1. And I'm telling you, this was, game was much better. But they give this one a five, whatever. Uh, if you like NBA Jam, I would say this is the one to get into. Even though you might find yourself preferring the sounds and graphics of Tournament Edition because that's what you grew up with. City of Lost Children is lamented as more of a movie than a video game. It's a bit of a survivor horror, but not very interesting. And Edge gives it a four out of ten. It was for the PlayStation 1, apparently. And yes, it's slightly based on the movie. Okay, more reviews. Crypt Killer, Konami's uh, shooting game with really bad graphics. So they only give it a four. Legacy of Kane, I don't know much about this series. Uh, Soul Reaver, I do know a little bit. But before that, there were 2D games. Uh, sold very well, apparently. And this game gets a six out of ten. Kind of like Zelda 3. Uh, Crush Kill and Destroy gets an eight out of ten, even. Even though I don't know much about this game. It looks to me like a knockoff of Command & Conquer. Made by Electronic Arts. So uh, that's them trying to compete with Westwood. Here's a Mighty Magic 2. Part 1 was never looked at it by Edge, but Part 2, I believe most people like the most. Maybe Part 3. Um, yeah, it's a really cute, simple strategy game where you build armies and fight enemies. Um, it's very, it's, it's, what's nice about it is it's really easy to find out what's, what you have to do. Everything's very easy to understand. So, um, and it's not as, and it's not any simpler than any other fighting games, uh, strategy games. Sonic 3D, a remake for the Saturn. Unfortunately, not Sonic Extreme. Gets a 6 out of 10, but nobody really liked it. And Batman Forever, even, but looking by Edge. For the Saturn, gets a 4 out of 10. A, uh, subpar. Great looking, however, uh, beat him up. So, Gallery here for MDK. I don't know. Uh, actual Soccer, Virtual Soccer 2. Yeah, Virtual Striker 2, that's what I'm looking for. Dreadnought, looking fantastic. We saw that earlier a couple months ago in Edge, I think. Um, CGI, I don't know, these games. Like, oh, Atlantis, that was a pretty looking game. Kind of like Mist. Let's uh, get to the end. Really weird advertisements to get in the business. Most people asking you if you could program in assembly. That's probably the best thing still at the time. C++ is also asked. So I don't think C Sharp had been developed back then. Uh, yeah, What did you need to work for Rare at the time? Let's take a look. Fluent in C or Assembler, yeah, they must be, or 3D artists. We're not looking for game designers. Nobody's looking for game designers. Of course not. The business at the time was only interested in graphics. Rygar, the arcade game. Um, in case you don't know it, the arcade version is a kind of an up-tempo Castlevania game-like um, with a Greek theme. Although some of Japanese, a lot of twangy sounds. Sounds a lot like a Mega Drive game. Um, or maybe a bit like Mega Man. Uh, I think it was a bit underappreciated. And Sega says, uh, Edge says the same. They say it's a shame that it, uh, not many people recall it. Uh, I think it was quite fun. Not quite the good level design as Castlevania. But still, a good romp. 
very good graphics at the time. One of the first games to use 16-bit uh, graphics. And some talk about elevator action returning, which I never liked. Uh, Mace the Dark Age, uh, made by Williams, who had some kind of contract with the Nintendo 64, so Mace would also make its way to Nintendo 64, but Soul Edge was much better, played much nicer. Mace the Dark Age did look good, though. There's no denying that. Um, better than Soul Edge, not as good as Soul Calibur. That would take another two years to be released, I think. So, And you fight with gods against each other. Virgil Striker 2. A uh, more of the same now using the Model 3 board, so uh, better looking than Virtual Striker 1, but the gameplay is more or less the same, they say. Uh, I saw it in arcades, I never played it though. Don't know if it has a cool following, but I bet it does. Darius G, the third version of Darius. Uh, I've never been that much into these shooting games. Uh, they use polygons instead of sprites, how about that? Or a combination of them. Vampire Saver, the third and last version of the Darkstalkers trilogy. I played a little bit of this on my PlayStation, and it was cool doing all the moves. Um, but people just preferred playing Street Fighter 2 competitively. And here you have the letters, people talking about the Yorozi, how it should be able to uh, use floppy disks to share the game, because you know, if you're going to be making demos, don't you want to share it with people? Um, some person incorrectly saying that buying the Eurozy doesn't let you own it, but actually Phil Harrison replies, you know, Mr. Sony in England, says, no, 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 you get to keep it. Enjoy it. It's worth the 550 pounds. Some uh, questions about, hey, what about Next Generation uh, having the same articles? Well, they're sister magazines, so sometimes they copy each other's work. Why not? Uh, so talk about Americans being... Um, what do you call it? <laughs> uh, being hurt by the words, sharp words spoken about Yanks in the magazine, whatever. And uh, people talking about the price of the PlayStation 1 games. And Sony sa uh, Edge saying, well, soon we'll have the classic series like these games. Ridge Racer, Tekken, what's this? Destruction Derby and Rad Region Toshiden being re-released in silver editions for cheaper. Uh, Q&A about how 3D engine, uh, graphics cards work. And the PC, if you use two, can you switch between them? And what does MMX do exactly? And finally, uh, so talk about how the eye is apparently only able to see 26 frames per second, but I still see the difference between 60 frames per second and 30 frames. What's up with that? Well, Edge says, you're right. You're, it's not 26 frames per second. You're, and your eyes can see more like somewhere around 50 frames a second. So it's good to have one that goes up to 60. It's much nicer to look at. Next month, I don't recognize this game. What is it? So they're going to San Francisco. Z Z axis, apparently making fancy graphics at least. And they're going to look at some coin ops. There will also be a 28 page supplement about the future of technology. I don't have that. So maybe I'll be able to find it in the meantime. I don't think so. So, uh, but still, check out next time, issue 44. And did we see Edge somewhere? Yeah, here it is. They always put in the word Edge somewhere. I am here seeing the 1064 logos. So, that was Edge issue 43. Not one of their best issues, although I guess some of the articles were funny. And uh, we'll see each other later.